Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Avik Sarkar of Synopsys, going to talk today about what's going on in simulation and next generation simulation challenges. Avik, chips are getting certainly much more complicated than they were in the past. We have sometimes two and a half D, three D type of architectures. We have multiple chips in a package. Those chips are not the same as they used to be. We also have all these parasitics because some of these chips are very advanced nodes. How do we deal with that? What, what kinds of challenges are you seeing coming up? Ed, this is, these are, you asked several questions, all of which are very, very important for our customers to solve as they go forward in this next generation of systems. Are they new challenges or are they the same challenges that we've been dealing with for a while, just more of them? It's a combination. It's definitely the evolution of the, the challenges that have always been there, but they have magnified significantly. And some of the data that we are seeing from our customers, especially as they move into the next generation technology node, as they integrate more and more functionality on the same SOC, things that used to be discrete earlier, especially analog circuitry, that are now coming into the same SOC, now they're putting high bandwidth memory, but much more capacity within a 3D subsystem. The number of vectors that they have to simulate have exploded significantly. The number of operating conditions have increased significantly. The, the PVTs across which they have to model, the cross-coupling effects, all of these have always been there, but now they have magnified. And more importantly, the margins that they have to deal with, the headroom has reduced. So given all of these, how do we help them solve this? How do we help them design, validate, and be successful with these next generation systems. And this is where the work that we have done becomes very meaningful. Let's dig into this. Sure. Avik, what are we looking at here? So Ed, going back to the question that you just asked earlier, are these new problems? Are these amplifications of prior problems? So let's take a step back. Let's look what happened five, six years ago. When even though we were on a five nanometer uh, technology node, the SOC was mostly digital. The analog circuitry, even though there was some analog circuitry on the chip, they were discrete in many cases, they were mature node, and the data rates used to be much lower. And most of these chips used to come together on a PCB and were designed and validated in that manner. But as we look at what's happening now, there are two directions where the complexity is increasing significantly for our customers, is we define them as systemic complexity, and scale complexity. Now, what do we mean by that? We are now aggregating a lot of different design style, a lot of different applications on the same SOC. And these, we are talking about analog circuitry that used to be traditionally off-chip. And then we are integrating larger and faster embedded memory and more complex IO with much, much faster data rates. So these challenges have obviously magnified all the issues that our customers dealt with earlier. And then what we are seeing also is in a 3D system, something that you talked about earlier, if on an interposer, for example, our customers are integrating high bandwidth memory, which is a stack DRAM. So the amount of the different type of challenges that our customers have to solve to validate, to tape out these designs and have them working on the first time around is significantly more. As you look at this, there's a lot more corners that people have to deal with. How has that, that number grown? When we look at the number of corners our customers have to simulate, I go back to the time when we were designing chips back in, I would say, early 2000s, and these were the first generation of 65 nanometer chips. We would simulate our SRAMs for maybe 30 corners, 40 corners. And now that is a four of 200 corners. And that's just the number of PVTs. And on top of that, the number of operating modes that you have to simulate for because you have integrated so many different functionalities on the same SOC. And then you have to input this system into an automotive system, for example, or automotive application and you have to meet very stringent reliability requirements. So the verifications that you have to do just became a lot more and a lot more stringent and a lot more complex. And because you have integrated analog and digital components on the same circuit, 
it's not just a transistor level simulation anymore. You have to do a mixed signal verification. So the complexity of it has increased significantly, not just because you have to simulate more process corners, not just because you have to simulate more operating conditions, but because you have to use these systems across a broader range of applications, and you have these systems come together across different applications as well. And because these chips are being used in much more safety critical, mission critical type of applications, these corners also matter more than they did in the past too, right? Something wrong here can Absolutely. actually kill somebody. Absolutely. For example, you may be parking your car in a hot sun in Las Vegas, and you decide to back your car up because of a high temperature or thermal issue, the camera subsystem decides to engage a little later and you don't notice or the radar didn't kick in and you don't notice that something is behind you. Obviously, those are the kind of scenarios you don't want to get into. So obviously, these are the different application scenarios. These are the different operating conditions that we have to design for and validate to. So where do you go with this? How do you make sure that you cover all these corners and all these bases and really understand what's happening? So we have to first look at solutions that address both these complexity areas. The systemic complexity, which is driving the need for a converged workflow, one that meets and the needs across all these different kinds of circuits, all these different application area. And the second also the meet the needs of the scale complexity, which is the number of devices are increasing, we are operating at higher frequencies, the margins are lower, as you said earlier, the number of PVT corners is higher, the parasitic impact is obviously much, much more dominant. So what we need to give our customers to solve these problems, are faster, higher capacity simulation platforms that work across this entire spectrum of needs that they have. All these different kind of circuit uh, types they have, all these different kind of circuit simulation needs they have, all the different reliability needs that they need to solve for. Have you achieved enough commonality across all these different designs to be able to say these tools work everywhere? Because that's been one of the problems. A lot of these designs are very domain specific. Indeed, when we work with our customers on solving their specific needs, for example, you may be designing a foundation IP, or you may be designing a large embedded SRAM or a flash circuit, or um, a PLL, or a DDR5, or a high bandwidth memory, for example. The, the size and the complexity of each of these are different, but the need for QR and sign-off quality is paramount across all of them. So we work very closely with both our foundry partners and with our customers for each of these specific applications to give them a solution that is tuned for these application requirements, but it is unified in giving them a common input, common output, all built around a unified design and verification environment so they can validate the memories, they can validate the analog and RF circuit, the custom digital uh, circuits that they're designing. And what we have to provide to them are engines that meets their specific requirements for both time and frequency domain simulation, for periodic or transient noise analysis, or if they want to do mixed signal verification, validating both the digital and the analog components. And as we discussed earlier, Reliability is obviously becoming very, very important. All these engines need to solve for these targeted verification uh, needs that they have to meet, for example, EMIR, self feed, uh, variability, and all these other uh, checks that they have to meet for. What you're describing here is the problem has just gotten much bigger because in the past you could take these individual pieces and break them apart and the classic divide and conquer approach to design. What we're looking at here now is an integrated system and sometimes even systems of systems. So now you have to take a look at all these pieces together as well as separately, right? So that's a great question, Ed. You know, when we look at the complexity of the circuits and the systems our customers have to solve, going back to your earlier comment, are these more of those old and the same, or these are different. It's definitely an amplified version of the traditional challenges, but it's becoming 
more and more in terms of number of uh, corners, operating conditions, parasitic effects, all of this. And most critically, all these subsystems have to operate with each other. When you were a discrete IC on a PCB, you had much more room. But now you're in the same silicon, you're in the same subsystem, the noise that you generate can cross-couple into another sensitive area. Or when the signal goes from one domain to another, you have to make sure that the timing and the performance and all of those are met. So the circuit complexity is increasing significantly as we go forward from the convergence of all these different requirements. And this is where the traditional approach in which relying on CPUs alone is becoming limited. And we have traditionally tried to solve it through uh, architectural changes by using innovative technologies. But what we see is the need for leveraging the heterogeneous compute environments that are now available to us, especially by leveraging GPUs, because the performance that we are getting out of them are significantly scaling as we go forward. You've got a hockey stick curve there of complexity. Are you able to keep up with that in terms of the next designs are not taking that much longer than the previous ones? Absolutely. What we want to deliver for our customers is the performance gains that comes from the combination of three things. Engine improvements, how can we solve for the increased amount of parasitics in an efficient manner? How can we develop an architect or de develop and deliver an architecture that does the partitioning more efficiently and looks at the circuits in a much more optimal manner? Benefit from the multiple threads and CPU cores that are available, and here we are looking at delivering 10x or more gains because of that, and then start to leverage GPU, which by itself gives us another 10x gain. So the combination of this, we can see very well, helps us scale and meet these specific challenges that our customers are now facing. But we have to deliver this not just for one application. We have to deliver this across a wide range of applications, across different kind of circuit styles, across different kind of simulation needs. So this is where the challenge it comes out. And this is where the benefit of looking at it holistically becomes very uh, crucial and beneficial for our customers. And really what you're doing is you're going wide as well as deep on this, right? So you've got the bigger picture. It's almost like when you're driving a car, if you could see 360 and also have all the controls at your fingertips, you would have a much better view of the road than you do just by looking straight ahead and looking at the side view mirrors. That is correct. And what you need are technologies that are finely tuned. So going back to the analogy that you made, yes, you need to be aware of the context and the surrounding that you have, and you also need certain guidance that helps you get there. The technologies that we develop are getting to production use because of the deep collaboration we have with our customers and also with our foundry partners. We already see the benefit of using this technology, using the new architecture, using the CPU multi-threading, using the GPUs on top of that, we are seeing our customers able to solve for circuits that they otherwise never thought was possible. Or they're able to reduce the simulation time from literally more than a month to few days, or from days to few hours. So you've addressed the what's going on in the, the mixed signal world. You've also addressed in, uh, some of the stuff that's going on in some of these advanced packages. What happens in things like high bandwidth memory, which is attached to these? Yes, indeed. And if we thought that the scale and the complexity of the problem for these advanced node analog circuitry was hard, just imagine when we are putting multiple DRAM chips and stacking them up the coupling effect and the verification requirements are significant. And this is where we had to deliver a new architecture just to leapfrog some of these challenges our customers are facing. And what we ended up creating through different architectural uh, changes, I would say, innovative partitioning, um, advanced modeling in which we have a new RC reduction algorithm, load modeling, or even using GPU acceleration for fast-spice application. This is a significant 
transformational change that was never even envisioned because GPUs are expected to deliver benefit for certain class of matrices. And they don't necessarily always apply to fast spice kind of simulation areas. And we were able to solve that. So what's the benefit for our customers like this? What we see today, when you have a customer who is able to solve a high bandwidth memory, for example, with our solutions today, they can solve maybe two of the memory dies with a controller. With the next generation solution, they're able to solve just today up to six of the memory dies. So we are able to deliver significantly more capacity. So they are upwards of 5 billion plus elements. And this is just the first uh, generation uh, representation of it. As we move forward uh, with this new architecture, we are optimistic that we can solve for higher capacities. And as our customers build these more and more, and as the needs of their evolve to model the cross-coupling effect or model the voltage drop as it goes across the whole die, it becomes a very important requirement uh, from, from them to us. And we are very optimistic that based on the results that we are seeing, we can meet and exceed those requirements. And those memory stacks are getting more complicated even themselves, right? Because now you have processors that are moving into the memory. Uh, Samsung is already pulling in AI into the HVM stack. So this just gets more and more complicated as we go forward. Absolutely. And this is where the unification of the simulation environment and the workflow becomes really, really critical. Given all this and given the complexity of where the, the chips are going, where the industry is heading in terms of pulling a lot of these different pieces together, are we on track to continue this kind of scaling that we've been used to? Will this start even accelerating over what we've been able to do in the past? With the progress that we have made in leveraging the different compute infrastructures that we have at our disposal now, and by this collaboration that we now have not only with our customers who are the end users in which we actually fine tune our algorithms and our engines to their specific needs and their specific end application. Now we are also working with the hardware vendors themselves. We have a very strong collaboration with the GPU providers, for example, in how do we optimize our libraries? How do we optimize some of the way we write the code because when we deploy the solution for one particular architecture, it has to be fine-tuned for another architecture. We are collaborating with the cloud uh, providers. So yes, it just cannot be one focus area or just one team that is working. It has to be a combination of effort and looking at all these different things in totality. One last question. As you look at this, also, you no longer have a team that's just being made up of a classic design engineer, right? Now you have design engineers and test engineers and architects and all these different uh, expertise, uh, material scientists sometimes coming together to figure out how do the pieces go together here? We commonly use the phrase here called continuum, becoming broader. It's not just a continuum of circuit simulator across a standard cell designer to a SRAM designer to analog to a memory to a mixed signal verification. This continuum expands even earlier. Can, as you're developing a new process node, can I get some early information so I can run some experiments and provide some feedback? Or if I'm already on a high volume node, can I provide some feedback in terms of what works for me, in terms of my library, in terms of my PNR tool? All those feedback can work most efficiently if there is a common talking language in, in which we are able to share information and the platform and the uh, infrastructure enables this collaboration. So this con continuum, we expect it to broaden and become more diffused across multiple different disciplines. A big star car, as always. Thanks for a great explanation. Absolutely. Thank you.